Hello everyone and welcome back to Clinical Cousins YouTube channel where today we are going to go over the basic functions of the kidney. This is just that need to know information that you have to have to be a great clinical provider. So let's start off by talking about the kidney itself. What does it look like? Well, it's a bean shaped organ, uh, specifically a kidney bean, right? It's a kidney bean shaped organ. We have two of them normally and they're located in what is called our retroperitoneum. This is a word that you're gonna have to know. Uh, you might have heard it like retroperitoneal bleeding, but it's basically just that area um, sort of in our lower back, about right there, um, sort of at that costovertebral angle that we talked about earlier. So this is our kidney, and what we need to know is that we have blood that comes into the kidney, and we have blood that goes out of the kidney. Now, the blood comes into the kidney, and it is processed, and it's worked on. So we take our blood, and there's a bunch of little workers, each of them have little jobs, and they work on it, right, until urine is formed, okay? So we have blood that's coming in, we have workers in our kidney, the little parts of the nephron that we're gonna talk about, and that is actually how we produce urine. And then the excess blood, the blood that has been worked on, it's our renal venous blood, it's actually gonna go back to the heart where the process will start all over again. So. We talked about the retroperitoneum. That is where the kidneys are located. So we know that we have two kidneys, right? And we know that the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the functional unit is that unit. It's the smallest unit possible where all of the functions of the kidney are going on. So when we talk about nephrons, we actually have a million to 1.2 million nephrons in each of our kidneys. So we actually have about 2 million to 2.4 million of these little nephrons. Now, we have to talk about the nephrons. They are so important. I, I promise you, if you understand the nephron, you are going to understand the kidney, and so many things are going to make sense to you. So let's talk about the nephron. There's two types of nephrons that we need to talk about. There are cortical nephrons, and there are juxtamedullary nephrons. Now, we have to know the parts of the nephron. So what happens is that blood that I was talking about, it's coming into the kidney, it actually goes through an afferent arteriole. Now we're gonna take a little pause. Afferent means coming towards us, while efferent means going away. So what's weird about the kidneys is that they have, the nephrons have two sets of capillaries. And it's sort of weird, there's a glomerular capillary, which is not a real capillary, and there is a peritubular capillary. Now that is the capillary that we know and love. It pushes fluid out, it sucks fluid back in, but right now we're gonna focus on the glomerular capillary. So we have an afferent arteriole, so we know that we're delivering blood to the glomerulus. That's this sort of squiggly structure that I drew right here. Now, afferent arteriole, it's blood. We're talking about blood right now. Blood enters and is filtered through the glomerulus. So if, if you guys have ever made, uh, or if you've ever seen like a cheesecloth, or if you ever made tea or coffee, you know that you have some sort of filter. So what we're doing right now is, imagine this is the water that we're pouring in, and all that protein, that large negative protein, imagine that as like the coffee grounds or the tea leaves. Now we don't actually want that in our tea. So it's the same thing here. We're pouring uh, all the water, all the coffee grounds, but only that coffee, only that water actually gets filtered, actually makes it out. So that's a good way to remember that proteins, those large molecules, that albumin is normally not filtered. So we have all this filtered fluid and it's actually contained in Bowman's capsule. It's, some sort of, it's sometimes called the ultra filtrate. It's that ultra filtered fluid that we're talking about. So we have all this fluid, it's in Bowman's space right here. There's a capsule, it's keeping everything nice and contained for us. It's like, kind of like our coffee cup. We're not spilling any coffee, no fluids leaking anywhere. And now, what happens to that blood that doesn't get filtered? Well, that is the efferent arteriole. It's the arteriole that's going away from us. And it's going to have a very important job here in just a second. So we have all this fluid, right? We have all this coffee. There's no proteins in it. There's no coffee grounds, right? All this fluid, what is so important about it? Well, we know that this fluid is actually going to be pushed down in this tubule. Now, the nephron is basically just a bunch of different tubules. It's like a long workstation, and there's different workers at each, at each part of the station. Now, all this fluid is going to be worked on by all of these different workers. We have 
a set of workers in the proximal convoluted tubule. We have a set of workers in the distal, uh, in the descending loop of Henle and the ascending loop of Henle. We have workers, different workers, in the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting duct. So we have all these different types of workers. They have different types of jobs, and eventually we have sort of a bloody fluid here. It's looking more watery, and then it eventually turns into urine. And that urine is that final product. It's what we don't want. It's what we want to get out of the body. So I talked about that efferent arteriole. It is housing that blood. It's a conduit. It's a passageway. It's a straw that has that fluid, that blood, that proteinaceous blood that we talked about. And all it's going to do, the efferent arteriole, it's going to turn into that capillary that we know and love. We're talking about the peritubular capillaries. Now these peritubular capillaries, we're going to talk about in a later video, but they are so full of protein. They have all that sucking pressure that they are actually going to run along the entire nephron and they are going to help us suck that fluid and those substances that we want to keep in our body. Now, that brings us to the two types of nephrons. This, this is an important thing uh, that we need to know because it's going to help us get a good picture of what the kidneys actually do. So cortical and juxtamedullary. Cortical. Cortical, you can think of them as shallow, okay? They are near the surface. Now this is the majority, it's about 85% of our total nephrons. These are the cortical nephrons and they're good workers. Now the cortical nephrons have those peritubular capillaries that we talked about. The peritubular capillaries are the suckers, right? They bring that fluid back in because they're full of protein. They're full of protein planets. They have a lot of gravity. They pull that fluid back in. Uh, they help us reabsorb. Now, juxtamedullary. Um, I had a great anatomy and physiology professor, Dr. Matthews, and he was also a vet, and he used to tell us that a great way to remember juxtamedullary uh, is to think of cats. So if you've ever been around a cat, if you own a cat, you know that when they pee, you can smell it. You can tell it smells a lot stronger. It's very concentrated. Now, uh, Dr. Matthews, he said that that's because cats have a lot of juxtamedullary nephrons. They have a lot of those really high-powered, uh, concentrated nephrons. Now, these guys are good workers. These guys are like fantastic workers. Now, they're only about 15% of our total nephrons, but they're extremely, extremely good at concentrating urine. That's what allows us to really concentrate our urine in high amounts. So these juxtamedullary nephrons, what is so different about them? Well, they are deeper inside the kidney, and that is why they're so good at their jobs. We'll talk about that later. But they are the minority. Remember, it's about 15% of our total nephrons, but they are highly, highly, highly efficient. And also, the main difference here is that they actually have a vasa recta. Now, this does similar functions to the peritubular capillaries, but if you need to know it for an exam, the cortical nephrons have peritubular capillaries, and the juxtamedullary nephrons have vasa recta. Uh, that is what helps reabsorb that fluid. Now that brings us to an important thing uh, that the kidneys do. You know, our kidneys help us with our fluid balance. Uh, they control our electrolyte balance. Very, very important. Uh, they release certain hormones to help maintain our blood pressure. But really, the overall function of the kidney that we need to know, if you remember nothing else from this video, it's that they filter, they reabsorb, and they secrete. And you may have heard that before. Uh, but as I was reading and as I was studying, I realized I didn't know it quite as well as I thought I did. Now, the first step is always filtration. That's what we talked about in the glomerulus. Do you remember? So we filter out fluid. We get that ultra filtrate. We get that coffee water. We get that uh, non-proteinaceous fluid. And this is what is filtered. Okay, so our glomerulus helps us filter our blood so we can get fluid that we can turn into urine. That's always the first step. We know that proteins are usually not filtered, but things like um, oxygen, CO2, glucose, uh, amino acids, these things are filtered. Now, reabsorption and secretion. This happens all throughout the tubule. Remember, filtration and then reabsorption and secretion. Now, what do we mean by reabsorb? What is doing the reabsorbing? When, I, when you think of reabsorbing, I want you to think of sucking, okay? Not in a bad way. We're talking about sucking fluid back. What is that thing that sucks fluid back again? Yes, that is the peritubular capillaries. We're talking about the vasorecta. Now, reabsorption. What are we reabsorbing? 
there are some substances in here that we want to hold on to, like glucose, um, so and and water and some of our uh, solutes like uh, potassium and sodium. So what we're actually doing when we reabsorb, we are actually the the substances are filtered and then we are actually taking those back into the blood into the body where we can hold on to them. So that is what we mean by reabsorption, where we are reabsorbing fluid and other solutes from the nephron back into the blood, into the body where we can hold on to them. Now, what do we mean by secretion? Okay, so secretion versus excretion, right? Excretion is actually leaving the body. So when you think of excrement, people are usually talking about feces, poop, uh, urine, things that we wanna get out of the body. Secretion is a little bit different. Now, what we're doing when we secrete substances is our little workers are actually taking things from our body and they're actually putting them on the assembly line uh, so that they can actually be processed and then put out of our body. So secretion is when we're taking things from our body and we're putting them into the tubules, while reabsorption is taking things from the tubules and then putting them back into our body. Now, we're talking about the kidneys and we're gonna spend a lot of time on the kidneys because they are so important and our heart thinks so. Our heart uh, pumps 25% of its cardiac output Remember that stroke volume times heart rate is about five liters per minute. Now out of all the blood that is ever pumped through your heart, about a fourth of it goes to your kidneys. Now what should that tell you? The kidneys are extremely, extremely important. Your brain doesn't even get that much. Your brain only gets 15%. Kidneys are getting 25%. Now why would the heart pump so much to the kidneys? Well, the heart doesn't have a brain. It's not thinking, but the kidneys demand this. They need 25% because they are so important in getting rid of our waste products and also regulating our blood pressure, our electrolytes, and our volume, our blood volume. Now, because there is a fourth of our blood is being pumped to our kidneys, we need to know some things that will dilate, that will increase that blood flow, and we also need to know some things that will constrict, that will decrease that blood flow in order to be better providers to our patient. So. Let's talk about it. Dilators, so these are things that are going to increase that renal blood flow. We're gonna get more blood to our kidneys so that they can do their job. That is our goal. Now, prostaglandins, our body produces prostaglandins. Now let's say they produce prostaglandins here, okay? So our body is producing prostaglandins. This is what's keeping our kidneys open. Um, in times of extreme stress, when you have all these catecholamines, this epinephrine, norepinephrine, if you give a ton of that to your patient, it will actually constrict the vessels and the vessels will get smaller and smaller and smaller. What prostaglandins do, like prostaglandin E2, for example, is they will actually prop that vessel open so that your kidneys can get blood flow. Now, what is the big no-no when your patient is in shock and their kidneys are really hurting? Maybe they have an acute kidney injury uh, where they don't, they're not getting as much blood flow. If you give them an NSAID, ibuprofen, those cyclooxygenase inhibitors, they will actually decrease prostaglandin synthesis and that vessel will have no choice but to contract and you can really hurt your kidneys by doing that. So let's talk about nitric oxide. We know that nitric oxide, it's a potent vasodilator anywhere you put it. That's going to increase our renal blood flow. Bradykinin, bradykinin, uh, we know that Brady Keenan, that should automatically trigger in your head ACE inhibitors. So we know that ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, it's that nasty enzyme that we don't like. We want to inhibit it because ACE inhibitors, they break down Brady Keenan. So that's going to decrease our renal blood flow. Um, and Brady Keenan, we also know is associated <coughs> that cough, that nagging cough um, that people can get with their ACE inhibitors because too much Brady Keenan can cause that cough. Uh, then you'll have to switch them to an angiotensin receptor blocker. So bradykinin, it's a vasodilator. It's good for our kidneys. Our kidneys like it. Um, dopamine. Why do I say it dopamine and not dopamine? Well, I say it dopamine because it helps me re remember what low, medium, and high doses of dopamine do. So dopamine at low doses. Um, a lot of times you'll see this if your patient is in shock. Sometimes you'll see a low dose of dopamine. That is given and that's because a low dose activates our dopamine receptors which will actually dilate our, our renal vasculature it's going to get blood flow to our kidneys so a low dose think d for dopamine it is going to increase the blood flow to our kidneys now 
if you decide to give your patient a medium dose uh, or prolong that dose over a period of time, it's going to activate our beta-1 receptors. So our beta-1 receptors, you're thinking beta-1 receptors are mostly in the heart. You're going to increase the heart rate, increase the conduction vo velocity through the AV node. You're going to increase the contractility. Now, if you give them uh, really high doses of dopamine, you're actually going to activate the D, the B, and the alpha receptors. So we know the alpha receptors is going to clamp down those blood vessels. It's going to raise our blood pressure, uh, specifically our diastolic blood pressure. And we're going to shut down all of these blood vessels right here. So they're going to feel really, really cold. And that's going to shunt all that blood to their vital organs. So last thing we're going to talk about, atrial natriuretic peptide. So atrial natriuretic peptide, if your atria uh, has too much volume, uh, your heart is being stretched out too much, there's too much blood, and it's going to say, hey, listen, we need to release the substance, we need to get things under control. Atrial natriuretic peptide is the exact opposite of angiotensin 2, so they have opposite effects. Don't believe me? We know that angiotensin 2, it brings the blood pressure back up. Atrial natriuretic, atrial natriuretic peptide, rather, it actually brings the blood pressure back down. It's going to dilate. It's going to get more blood to our kidneys. Now let's talk about those constrictors. These are the things that we need to watch out for uh, if they're taking an excess. So epi, norepinephrine. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, I'm talking about our catecholamines, okay? Our catecholamines in high doses, dopamine in a high dose, epinephrine in a high dose, norepinephrine in a high dose. These will actually constrict that renal blood flow. These are going to be our constrictors. These are things that can possibly hurt our patient's kidneys. So we can really constrict them if we give too much epinephrine, too much norepinephrine. Angiotensin 2, we know that there's, that there's excess angiotensin 2, it can actually decrease our renal blood flow. Remember, angiotensin 2 is meant to bring the blood pressure back up. It affects BAAK, bring it back up. It's going to affect our brain, right? It's going to make us more thirsty. It's going to release ADH. We're going to hold on to more water. It's going to affect our arterioles. Uh, we're going to constrict them, bring that blood pressure back up. It's going to affect, uh, it's going to release aldosterone. So when we release aldosterone, we're holding on to more salt, holding on to more water. We're getting rid of potassium, not a good thing. And it's also going to affect our kidneys. It's going to increase that salt reabsorption. Now, we're going to talk about endothelin one. Uh, lastly, this is something that it, it can sometimes be released by your endothelium. Uh, when they're injured, but it's a very potent vasoconstrictor. We need to know that endothelin 1 can also really constrict our kidneys, and you can really hurt your kidney if you have too much of that. So uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the video today. This is kind of a shotgun approach at teaching the kidneys, but we had to get this information in our brains so that we can process what is going on in the nephrons, what is happening on that assembly line, who are the different workers. We're going to meet the different workers. Uh, that work at your nephron and keep us going. Uh, so as always, thank you so much for taking the time to learn with us today. And remember to like and subscribe for more content. Thank you.